ask people who do have family in the area, but they don't like the cooking of the family that they're with, do. So. She just gave me a huge job to do, didn't she? Right. <laughs> uh, it, it gets put in Tupperware whether we need it or not. So it's either going to go bad in the fridge or it's going to be in somebody else's. Um, tonight at uh, 6 is prayer uh, by Zoom. Don't forget to join in and pray for one another. Uh, the prayers uh, are heard by the Lord and it makes a difference uh, in our daily lives. Um, and then Monday night is Daniel 6. six. Zoom and in person. If you want to come and you know be around other carbon-based life forms, you you can come to Miss Joyce's house. She'll you know separate us appropriately if we need to be separated. She doesn't let me sit next to Joe very often. So uh, we are going to have a great time.
the, the aroma, I, I like that she talked about that with the kids because when I, was, uh, when I was about 13, I had four paper routes, two early in the morning before I went to school and two after school. The early morning route, I, I did the downtown section and there was a bakery, a bread bakery, uh, when I would ride by on my bike and the smell of baking bread every morning it was just wonderful. I tried to get them on as a customer for the newspaper route because I thought I could, you know, finagle a barter system with them, but that just didn't happen. Um, it, uh, now, I, I do, I do want to say something. I've titled my sermon today, uh, When Your Thank is Half Full. Um, I guess I have moved into the realm of being a gearhead. You know, I love my, I love Ruby my 68 Mustang. I said that one time, and they said, I thought your wife's name was Sharon. Uh, but I, I have never considered myself to be a, a gearhead, you know, a, a mechanic guy. But I do, I have found out that lately, I have started to use more car illustrations and stories to make my points, uh, to get my points across. I relate to them a little bit better now than... Uh, than I did before. So today we're going to have this automotive theme, or at least, you know, it's an automotive title, uh, When Your Thank is Half Full. Um, Sharon and I actually have this constant, we'll call it a conversation, um, about putting gas in her car when the little light comes on. See, she sees the light come on and then she just switches the display to the uh, miles to empty. And then she waits for that to get down into the single digits, maybe even down to zero miles to empty, and then she'll kind of maybe just kind of coast in on fumes to the gas station and, and fill up. Or, and this is where the conversation comes in, she brings it home knowing that the next morning I have to use the car and then I have to pray all the way to stripes to make sure that I get there. Um, uh, I, she said, well, you know, if it was important, they would, you know, make an alarm sound or have it flash or do something like that when the fuel gets low. I said, honey, the light is for when the fuel gets low. That's when it tells you. Well, there's so much more fuel left when the light comes on. See, I'm not like that. My, my car gets to a quarter tank and, and I fill it up. I don't want my tank to be on empty. I don't want my tank to be on empty either. So, we're going to look at that today, and that's also, I, I consider that a little bit of marital counseling as well, so there's double <laughs> purpose to that. I may need some after the service. Uh, we, we are taking a break from Acts, I will tell you that, uh, because the holiday is here, and I guess that's the whole point. If I could just be very blunt, is your thank half full? It's been a tough year. If you saw my... Um, uh, my devotional from this week. And I, I know for you, just like for me, 2020 has been a difficult year to find things that we're thankful for. Um, my, my devotional was called Thanksology this past week. If you haven't seen it, you, you may want to check it out. Yes, I didn't make up that word, though. It, uh, a friend of mine, Robert Butler from uh, the North, uh, made it up, and I took it from him. Um, in, the, in the sermon or the devotional, I even mentioned the crack in the earth that we talked about, or the moon that we talked about earlier, and that a monster is probably going to come out of that and eat the earth. I had a picture of it. Show that uh, next slide. Yeah, there's the monster. That's, that's Donatelli Versace. <laughs> but she looks like a monster, or he, I don't even know. Um, uh, and, and there were all kinds of other things. Those things kind of take us away from thinking about the blessings that we have, all the things that have happened this year. Um, are, you, are you there? Is it hard for you to find things to be thankful for this year with everything that's going on? Is your thankful or is it on empty, on E? Um, and I do need to explain something here because I'm going to do something that I've never done before in a sermon or a message or a service. I'm going to talk about the election. I'm not going to talk about politics or who should be or who did or, or what. I'm going to talk about the effect that this one event has had on our nation, the world, 
and the church. And we're going to look at it. So I'm not going to, you know, be criticizing or demeaning or negative, but I want to use it as, as an example uh, that, that's fresh for us, that we're going through right now, that might be emptying your thank so that it's not full. I want to talk about the things leading up to the, uh, the, the election and how we responded and, and uh, what happened and what is happening. Not about the choices, not about the candidates or the specifics and things that we think we know and we most likely don't. Just monitor that because I don't know why we've got gremlins in the uh, system today. Um, all right, let's uh, move on. Uh, the whole country, of course, has been preoccupied with this latest drama in our lives with the election. Uh, both the run-up and the drama uh, that's uh, here after the election has happened, and the uncertainty with it. Um, all along as I listened to candidates, not just from the, the national um, uh, campaigns, but even down here on the local level, uh, I, I wasn't sure who to believe. I wasn't sure who was telling the truth. And not every one of my candidates, especially here on the local level, won. And I'm pretty sure that's probably the way with many of us. Part of the beauty of our country is that we have the opportunity to vote our leadership in. Uh, and that's part of what we celebrate as well on Veterans Day. That's why we, we honor and thank those men and women who have served and who are serving so that we can continue to have the freedoms that we have in this country that are unique to this country. That's why people will leave everything that they know to come here, and they still do that today. Uh, that's why we thank uh, the uh, veterans. We don't want those freedoms taken away or the perception that those freedoms will be taken away and those men and women who are fighting for those freedoms. And I know this uh, in, in your creek notes. Um, most of you, I think all of you would say that you love your country. But our allegiance has to be first to Jesus Christ as Christians. Our allegiance has to start with Jesus. Uh, the, oh, there's coffee back there, too. I'm thankful for that. Uh, remember the words of uh, Jesus from the Gospel of John 13 when he said this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then verse 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then... Uh, in John 17, it's a repeat from my devotional, uh, and this is kind of what started me down this uh, pack, uh, path. It's from Jesus' final prayer, and Jesus said this when he prayed to his Father in verse 22 of John 17. The glory that you have given to me, I give to them, that they may be one even as we are one. Another translation said, perfectly united. Verse 23, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. So why are we looking at this again? Because it's, it really needs to be taught and in our minds over and over and over again. It needs to be repeated. It's that important. And it also has to start with you and I, with Christians, with believers, with Jesus followers. See, people will take notice when they see you and I coming from different places in, in the world when they see us loving one another in a sacrificial manner. They'll realize slowly that when we are one, the world will come to know that the Father sent this reason that we can be one and love one another, even with all of our differences, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus says that a little bit further 
uh, a little bit before that in, in John 3, 17, right after the verse that we all know. But here's the issue that I see. How can I expect a non-believer, someone who doesn't recognize who Jesus is, how can I expect them to act like a believer in Jesus? Well, the answer is this. I can't. I, I can't. It's, it's hard enough to, uh, to follow Jesus and act like Jesus as a believer. We've talked about that. It's difficult to be an ambassador for Christ outside in the world because the, uh, the, the world that we live in is, is difficult and filled with anger and hatred and broken, imperfect people just like you and just like me. So how can we expect someone who doesn't believe in Jesus to act like Jesus? We can't. Sometimes we barely do. Um, I saw this on, on Facebook this last week. It was a post, not from a family member of mine, but from a friend, a close friend of our family's, who she said this. Um, she said, don't take this personally, or do. There are 4,900 plus friends on my page, said, if you voted for Biden, say so. If not, unfriend me, love you all. Uh, or another one that talked about, if you believe this, then shout it out. If you don't, unfriend me, you're a racist. What social media wasn't supposed to do that, was it? Wasn't it supposed to allow us to connect and friend people and get to know things that are happening outside of our own small, little, narrow view? When I see posts like that, I really wanted to respond that no matter who I voted for or what I believe, especially if I didn't vote for your candidate or don't believe in the things that you believe in, don't you want to have a conversation about it? Don't you, don't you want to have a conversation so that we can better understand where other people are coming from? And maybe I might learn something in the process or teach something in the process. Help me better understand what and why you believe as you do. I've seen posts like that from believers as well as non-believers. Churches. But nope, we don't want that. Why? Well, because the... The world and we are sometimes filled with rage and, and anger and malice. Colossians chapter 3 stuff where Paul talks about the old is dead and the new has come. And those are in the top three of the old. And the most important one on the new is love. But we don't want that. We tell people to boycott stores if they don't vote our way. I've seen people tell others to stop defending their choice because they don't want to hear it. I truly believe that we do need to hear both sides so that we can learn and grow. I've seen some, unfortunately, pretty ugly comments from Christians, from leaders in the church, uh, people who have said things that have shocked me. And it takes a lot sometimes to shock me because of the things that I've seen uh, and the people that I've met, all because they see the world differently. They have a different filter through which they see the world. Do we really believe that we're going to change someone's mind by uh, hatred and anger and, and sarcasm? I don't, I don't think you can argue someone into the kingdom. I, I think you can love them regardless of the decisions that they're making, and show them the love of Christ, and then you'll start, they'll start to question. But I don't think you can ang uh, argue someone into the kingdom of heaven. The struggle is that uh, I, I believe, and I know, this is old-fashioned thinking. It's outdated. But I think one of the issues is that we don't follow the golden rule anymore. Remember that? It's in your, in your notes. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat people like you want to be treated. That's the struggle. It's pretty simple, but we don't abide by that. It's old-fashioned. We've learned so much more now. 
Um, I was going to talk about driving, but that hits a little bit too close to home for me because I tend to be a, a pretty uh, aggressive, uh, assertive, uh, strong driver. I'll say that. Um, but, you know, if, if you let someone merge in front of you, you know, I, I always wave if someone does that and just to say thank you, you know. That's, that's really all I'd like to see. Uh, and, and not people force their way over and run me off the road or make me put the, the brakes on, on on Ruby. Ruby doesn't stop easily. Or she doesn't like to stop. She wants to go fast. We've had that conversation over and over again. Okay, now as we move forward, we can see that Jesus also asked, uh, w- was asked what the greatest commandment was in Mark 12. And here's what he said in uh, verses 29 through 31. Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then, verse 31, the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other greater commandment than these. And that's it. That's all we're called to do. Easy peasy, right? It's like Colossians 3 when, when uh, uh, Paul talks about clothing yourself in these new things. Love and kindness and patience and peace. It sounds easy, doesn't it? Just put on a new garment and you're a new person and go. It's, it's not that easy in reality. That's all we're called to do. And who is our neighbor? All of humanity. Every person that we come in contact with is our neighbor, regardless of what they look like, where they came from, who they are, what decisions they make, who they voted for or didn't vote for, what country they're from, whether they like peanut butter and jelly, crunchy or smooth. None of that matters. That's your neighbor, and you're supposed to love them. However, the peanut butter thing is a little bit difficult for me to get over. As we, here's the point. This is, as we love our neighbors, a, as we love God, we're loving our neighbors. And as we love our neighbors, we love God. It's a cycle. You can't love God without loving your neighbors. Just like I said a, a, a few weeks ago, I, I used to think that you had to love God, but then you had to love yourself before you could love others. But if I love God and realize that I'm a creation, a child of his, that he made me in his image, how can I not love what God has created? And I use the analogy as parents, we still have our kids' artwork from when they were children. And we love those masterpieces, those creations, even if I have no idea what they are. I love them because those that I love created them. I love humanity, my neighbors, because the one that I love created them. Does that make sense? We can't separate uh, people that we love, our brothers, our neighbors, according to religion or race or age or gender or politics or anything. We are called to love. That's the bottom line. Even to love those who are different and difficult and don't agree with you, especially to love those. Uh, That's where we're at as a country, isn't it? Isn't that right where we are? And I believe it's up to the church, not to to protest or boycott, but to have a conversation. And maybe even at some point to, to repent, to ask for forgiveness. Isn't that the whole thing that the Jonathan Kahn event was all about? Repentance as a nation. Now, I can only repent for those things in my personal life that I've done personally. I can't repent for, you know, things that other people have done. I mean, in my circles with people that I know. On a national level, we need to uh, look at that in a different manner. I can only repent and ask forgiveness for what I've done against God and against my brothers and sisters. But the church, through Jesus Christ, it is Bottom line, the last and only hope for the world. 
Amen? And because of that, we have to reach out, we, the church, have to reach out and love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, now, uh, in regards to, like, election day and some of the things that happened, I heard stories that even here in Corpus Christi, people got there earlier and had to wait two hours to get in. The lines were so long. And in some communities here, larger cities here in Texas, five to six hours standing in line to, to go vote. I don't think anyone, even the elected officials and the election, the people who run the elections, wanted to have those kind of lines and that kind of drama and that difficulty in, in the process. It wasn't good for anyone. But I don't believe that that was uh, inherently a bad thing or an intentional thing. I believe that there were some catastrophic issues um, I don't know enough to call them mistakes, and I'm not going to call them that until the facts are in. Uh, end of story. I'm not saying anything more until those facts do come in. Uh, it happened. But what didn't happen is more interesting and important to me than what did happen. What didn't happen is when those mistakes came to light, I didn't hear uh, apologies or or. or uh, um, you know, requests for forgiveness or uh, pleas to, to help resolve the situation. What did we hear? Blaming and, and arguing and throwing people under the bus, you know, uh, shifting of responsibility and all those other things. You know, whatever happened to the days when you make a mistake or you do something wrong and you just say, I'm sorry, I blew it. And then we move on. Can't we just own the things that we do and, and move on? How much easier would it be if we just did everything that we were supposed to do? And I'm not talking about on a national level. I'm talking about, you know, at home. If I just took the trash out like I was supposed to do, instead of, I heard that, uh, instead of uh, putting it off to the last minute or doing half a job, and opening up the garage door and just sitting in the garage next to the door. So it looks like I did my job, but I didn't, because Friday, I, I missed trash day. And now I've got trash in the garage, and I'm going to have to put it in my neighbor's. No, I, I'm not going to do that. I'll drive down to Ron's house. He lives pretty close. <laughs> Wouldn't it be so much easier if we just did what we're supposed to do? And did it the way that we're supposed to do it. Then you don't have to fabricate all these intricate stories to hide what was done. Or, or to cover up the bad things that I've done or the mistakes that I've made. You just do it. You let the chips fall where they will. And life goes on. It would be so much easier. I believe that's, you know, uh, the only people who would be unhappy in those situations are the attorneys, the lawyers, who would lose millions of dollars in lawsuits because we wouldn't have to have them. They could go off and be, uh, I don't know, golfers or fishermen, you know, do something productive. They wouldn't get paid. I believe that's part of what's missing in our world, especially in the Christian part of the world, you know, in a world that's filled with much anger and division, in a culture that wants to blame everyone else for everything that's going on, Maybe what society needs is a church that demonstrates and models taking responsibility when we've done something wrong. When, when we've made a mistake. When we've hurt someone. And just say, I'm sorry. That was never my intent to hurt you. I apologize. How can I make it right? Maybe that's what the world needs to see instead of casting blame and condemning others when we see a, a problem, especially when we don't agree with that other person. We can help be a part of the solution, can't we? When we blame, when we accuse, what happens? Immediately, defenses go up and progress stops. When we refuse to engage in conversations, we're never going to find two things, hope and resolution. Um, I had a thought that came to mind about that, and it just left me. 
not enough caffeine in my system. There's too much blood in here and not enough caffeine. When we refuse to engage in conversations, oh, well, it'll come to me at 3 o'clock in the morning and I'll text you all and let you know. Confession and repentance. Um, those things help bridge the, the chasm, the gap between blame and responsibility, between uh, uh, authority and accountability. Uh, oh, I know what it was. You ever ha- run through your mind when something has happened, all the conversations or possible conversations that could take place when you confront this person about what's going on? And you're going through all these end of the, the world scenarios in your mind, and when you get there and you actually have the conversation, and everything goes fine. Most of the time, that's what happens, is we build it up in our minds, but the reality is, all we do is end up resolving the issue and moving on. But we don't want to have conversations. We, we, could, we would rather dump things out there uh, in the public forum on social media, and those inner conversations, we type them out and write them online instead of going to the person and Speaking that to them, uh, Pastor Matt talked about a situation where he just commented on, on uh, uh, something. I don't even know if it was a politician. And he was blasted on social media all the way down because he said, listen, I, we shouldn't criticize this person for something that they've done that long. Maybe they've changed. Maybe they've actually grown and changed from their ways. But we remember what they did 30 years ago. Uh, As a church, you and I, we're called to be different, aren't we? We're called to not look like the world out there, divided, angry, full of strife, division, and malice. Paul reminds us we're not to be the world. We can't act like the world does. We need to be difference makers. We need to be the people who help others see Christ. And when we we, uh, think about ourselves personally, on a personal level... Uh, Maybe there are things in your life that are still burdening you, that you have unresolved in your life. I talked to uh, a lady this week from a church who her whole family has essentially uh, disowned her because of her beliefs, because of of, um, actions that she took, that right or wrong, she took them, but she's still family. And this is how divided we've been in our country. We've become in our country. And, and Jesus and his word and says to love one another. Love your brothers and sisters. And we're cutting out family members because they don't act like us. They don't believe like we do. Or they do something that has hurt us. And we can't move beyond that hurt. If you have kids or grandkids, don't you think for a minute that they're not watching how you respond to the things that are going on in the world. They will imitate you more than anyone else in their lives. They're watching how you react. And people at work who know you're a Christian especially, or at school, or in the world, they are watching how you react and what you say. So it was interesting to me that that Jonathan Kahn event keeps coming back up in my mind. I didn't get to see a whole lot. <clears throat> I saw his prayer on Saturday morning. And, and that was all about confession and repentance and turning and changing the world. Are there things in your life that you need to change in your world? Maybe to go to a brother or a sister or a parent or a child, and ask for their forgiveness for things that you've done or the perception of things that you've done. I just said to my kids a few weeks ago, listen, if as we were growing up and your mom and I were in the ministry, if we ever said to you or made it appear like we were saying, you need Jesus, then I'm sorry. That was wrong. And that's not what we intended to say. What we intended to say and meant to say was, we need Jesus. We're not perfect. It's not just that 
You need something. We all need Jesus. And I asked for their forgiveness. When I confess my sins, even the sins uh, that I committed when I unintentionally hurt someone. Sins about the things that I've done and the things that I should have done that I didn't do. Maybe when things didn't come out right or, or uh, I, it's not what I intended. What happens then is the healing begins to take place. It starts that process of healing. It should never be in our, our intent to hurt someone. Well, we do that on the personal level. Guess what? It can happen on a church level, a community level, a national level as well. Start the conversation and begin the healing process for each one of us. Imagine if that would happen today in, in families and churches and communities. If we would start the conversation with, I'm sorry if anything that I've done has hurt you or offended you. It's not my intent. If we were sincere and committed about loving our neighbors. That doesn't mean you have to hang out with that person or, or have them over for Thanksgiving to eat your Cajun fried turkey. But it does mean you need to extend compassion and love and kindness to them. Someone told me this past week that they felt like a hypocrite whenever they treated someone who had hurt them uh, nicely or, or, uh, or someone who was just a jerk. Well, I feel like a hypocrite if I do that. And I said, you're not, you're not a hypocrite. You're a Christian. Isn't that what Jesus tells us to do? You're loving your neighbor. And that's what we're supposed to do. The one thing that we're supposed to do. Maybe they'll recognize God's love is being given to them and it'll change them as well. Right now, though, everything in our world seems to be lined up towards hatred and anger and division and strife. The media plays off of it, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Those good stories, those positive stories, they might give you warm fuzzies, but they're not going to bring in the ratings. Not as much as hate and violence and all of that stuff does. And a healthy society doesn't just happen, does it? It takes work. A healthy relationship between a husband and wife, between friends, family members, doesn't just happen. It takes work, constant work. A healthy society is the same way. It takes work, lots of work. Our nation is so divided, just like those Facebook posts. If you don't see life my way, then away with you. I'm done with you. And that prayer from Jesus in John 17 is a, is a call. It's his final prayer. It's all about unity. And it's his final prayer. The last thing that he wanted to impart to his disciples is for unity, is to love one another. It's all about you and, and the entire church to be one unified body of believers. Not denominations and groups of people getting together to throw stones at other groups of people but to be united. And you know when, as we're studying Acts, uh, you know when the early church was at its best? When it was its strongest? It was always countercultural and united in love. That's when it was its strongest. Don't we want to see a church like that today? Why? Because a divided nation needs a united church. A divided nation needs a united church. That's, that's why we, we don't normally talk politics in church. You can vote as you believe God is calling you to vote. I'll respect that. And I think the, the larger body of believers uh, should re respect that as well. But the church is losing out on, on a lot of people the younger generation, and people who are disenfranchised from church. And part of it is because they see the same division in the church that's going on outside of the church. They see the same anger and hatred and, and strife and malice. They see the inauthentic church at work. The, the exper they experience uh, as well the, uh, the, the hypocritical church. Do as I say, not as I do. The divided church. They don't want that. I don't want that. Why would anyone want that? That's what they're getting outside. They, the, the world is tough enough. 
outside these doors. They want something different when they come in here to this place. The church should be a place of, of refuge where we experience the power and the glory of God and a unity, a peace, and a loving kindness that flows from him through us to one another, not what they get outside these doors. The world around us, if you looked around, and I've heard this from some of you, just seems tired, exhausted at the end of its rope. It's been a long and hard and trying year dealing with the virus, dealing with, with work issues, with family issues, social injustices, sickness, uncertainty, the economics of all the stuff that has happened to our country. And then on top of that, the, the election and the drama that's surrounding it. We're all running on fumes. Our thank is half full. But I don't think any of us knows how to stop that chaos and running and tiredness. And, and now, honestly, we've got Thanksgiving and Christmas upon us. Now you're like, this is a Thanksgiving message? We'll get there. How do we stop? You know, some of you are thinking, and Sharon and I have had this conversation, what about Black Friday? How is that going to work with, with this pandemic? Christmas shopping. Uh, you know, will, will our families be able to meet? You've heard the stories about communities, states, saying, no, sheriffs will go into the houses to make sure that there's only six or ten people, or whatever the number is, meeting in your personal, private residence. Will our families meet? Will we miss, on, miss out on those great family traditions? More things upon more things just to make us tired and weary and looking at life as if our thank is half full. Yet we have one, the one, who proclaimed it to us and encourages us to come to him over and over again. He calls the weary and the heavy laden, the burdened, come to me, come to me, come to me. I am the one, the only one, he says, who can give you rest. The only one who can fill your thank. So how can we, the church, help? I think the call for the church is is to simply and most profoundly be the church that Jesus Christ created. We need to be an alternative to what people are finding out there. I spoke to someone yesterday who said, I want to be a part of your church. I have some obligations, some commitments that I've made, but I want to be a part of your church. And the reason that I was given was exactly that. Because you're not like the world. It was warm and welcoming. It's an alternative to what's happening outside in the world today. So we need to have authenticity, grace, and hope, which comes from the power of Jesus Christ in your life and in my life. Having his word in our lives. We can admit, uh, admit when we don't have the answers. Uh, you know why? Because it's very obvious that we don't have the answers. We don't have them. I have my thoughts, but do I know uh, the future? Do I know what's going to happen tomorrow? No, I don't. But I know who holds the future in his hands. And I trust him. And I hope you do too. And hopefully I pray I can make Jesus known by my words and my actions. So right now, we see our society filled with anger and so much self-centered anger that they, they can't see what's happening on a big scale because of the anger that's burning within them and the wrongs that they feel like, the injustices that they feel like have happened to them. There needs to be an alternative. Hope counters hate better than hate counters hate, doesn't it? Isn't that true? Hate, all it does is, is grow more hate. But hope can start to break down the walls of hate. It doesn't happen overnight because it also takes trust. And trust takes time to build. The world needs to get back to a place where they trust those people that carry the label Christian. You need to make sure that you're one of those people. But it is possible. And hope is what the church is all about. 
Hope is what the church, when we're at our best, what we can offer the world. It's not hope in, in a man. It's not hope in a politician, in Trump or Biden or anyone else. It's not hope in a, in a political party. It's hope in Jesus Christ, the one who defeated death. If we echo the culture, then all we get back is the culture. And that's where the church is today, unfortunately, in many places. But imagine if in the next few months, in our church, in our homes, at work, at school, wherever we were, uh, love surged, not anger. Hope exploded, not rage. Grace erupted, not violence. Imagine God's power unleashed and people experience Jesus through you and I. We could disagree at that point, but not be disagreeable. We could focus on what unites us, not what divides us and tears us apart. Just imagine what would happen if we could do that. I bet our thanks would be full then. Do you trust the one who rose from the grave? Do you trust the one who pours out his love to you and I because of the love that the Father has given him and he tells us to do one thing, to pour out his love to you and I? This Thanksgiving, pray for our country but pray more specifically and intimately in your homes, to your families, to your friends. Pray for them. Pray that you would be able to love one another as Christ has loved you. Can I pray with you now? Please stand with me and let's pray. Lord, this is a, a difficult year for many of us with with uh, all of the events that have happened in 2020. But we can pretty much push all those things to the side because we look to the one who holds the future in his hands. We look to the one who knows uh, our inner workings. And you know where we are and who we are. And you love us. And all you've asked us to do is to love you with all of our hearts and to love one another. So it doesn't matter about the stressful things that are going on in the world today as long as we do this one commandment that you've given to each one of us. And when we start to focus on other people in our lives and loving them, then, then that hope that we talked about begins to increase in our lives and in the people that we are loving. And we're sometimes not good at saying that. We express it in ways that maybe people don't realize that we love them. So help us to be better, Lord, at communicating that love. And as we love one another, Lord, allow our, our thanks to be full. Allow us, Lord, for our love to overflow and spill out to not just the easy people to love, but to those who are difficult to love, those who disagree with us, those who don't see things the way that we see things. And allow us to sit down and have conversations once again, like we used to do in the old days. And resolve the issues that we have with our brothers and sisters and people that we love and care for so that we can move on and be the body of Christ, be the church united, and provide an alternative for those who are outside these doors who desperately want that hope and that peace and that joy and that love and that kindness that flows only from you to your children. As we go through this week, give us each day, Lord, things to be thankful for. Bring to our, to our minds all the wonderful blessings that you have given to each one of us. This place to worship friends and a church family that love us and support us and want to be there for us. Opportunities for pumpkin lasagna. There are so many things, Lord, that we, are, we have as blessings. Just bring them to our mind. And then as we sit around the table on Thanksgiving, 
Allow us, Lord, to just be overwhelmed with the good things that you have brought to us and share those with those around the table because we as a family desperately need to hear the blessings that you've provided for us. Keep us safe during this holiday season so that we would remember that it's not about us and the gifts and the fall to roll and the commercialism. It's about you, Jesus, as a baby coming to earth and, and walking in the places that we will walk as human beings and showing us your love for us so that we can one day be reunited with you in heaven. And so, Lord, allow us to focus on Christmas as Jesus uh, and his birthday and his sacrifice that he will make and the love that you show for us by sending your son. Be with us, keep us strong, keep us healthy. And as we go from this place, Lord, the sanctuary, allow us to always remember those good things that you bring to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. You may be seated.